Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover The Passage of Power by Robert A. Caro. This is the fourth of four books that are part of Caro's The Years of Lyndon Johnson series. This is book 11 for my 2021 reading list. Well, if you missed any of the first three episodes that where I covered the first three books of this series, I invite you to, to go back and listen to those. Uh, I'll link to those at the top of the show notes, but they, they give a lot of context for what is in this episode, and I will also be referring to those throughout this episode. There's a quote by the man by the journalist Ward Just, and he says this, The man of power who suddenly finds himself short of it is a fascinating study. The man of power who suddenly finds himself short of it is a fascinating study. Well, this book does just that. It is, it is a study of a man who, of power who suddenly finds himself short of that, that power. And then it goes further into a man gaining even more power than he had before. And we're talking about LBJ, of course. And this book starts in 1958, where LBJ is still in power. He is the second most powerful man in Washington after the president. And he is the Senate Majority Leader. He has amassed such a level of power for himself that it is unprecedented in the history of the Senate. His lifelong ambition, though, is to become president. And he just seems like he's going to be the natural person for this upcoming 1960 election, to be the the Democrat for the ticket. But there's something holding him back. And what's holding him back is something we've talked about in the other other episodes, and that is his own fears and insecurities, his fear of failure, his fear of humiliation. And what those fears cause him to do is to delay the announcing of his candidacy, because if he doesn't put himself forward, he can't fail. But in that vacuum, there's a young senator named John Fitzgerald Kennedy who becomes the nominee. The very next morning after becoming the nominee, Kennedy asks LBJ to be his running mate to the utter horror and shock of his brother, Robert Kennedy. JFK realizes that he needs that Southern vote, and he he thinks that by having Johnson as the VP on the ticket, he will get that. And he's right. And Kennedy even says later that he won that, that election because of the Southern vote and because of LBJ. But JFK is also a a pretty bright guy, and he knows that having so powerful of a man continuing as the Senate Majority Leader, a man who really considers himself that he should be the one who who should be president, well, that that man could be very dangerous to JFK's presidency. And so there's also this idea that that perhaps JFK wanted him as VP to, to rein him in a little bit. Well, uh, JFK wins, obviously, and becomes president in early 1961. So kind of the middle part of this book is 1961 through 1963. LBJ is vice president, and he's the second most powerful man in Washington, but that is by name only. He has lost all of his Senate majority power. He is now really just the symbolic second most powerful man in Washington, but not the actual as he was before. And then JFK and RFK make it so that even whatever he could have had, uh, that even that's taken away from him because they're, they're, they're fearful that whatever power he does get, he will, he will take it to the next level. And if you, if you go back into LBJ's life, you see that time and time again, just a little bit of power and he, he makes it into something completely different. He takes a little bit of power and, and increases it in, in orders of magnitude. So LBJ becomes a laughing stock. There are journalists openly asking, where is Lyndon Johnson? Who? Wh- where where is he gone? And who is Lyndon Johnson? This is a this is a fear throughout LBJ's life of, of people not knowing who he is. And and journalists are openly asking this in the papers. He has just become the laughing stock of Washington, D.C. And Robert Caro takes you right into that drama by shifting perhaps how you look at the assassination of John F. Kennedy. 
I'm used to seeing the the video shots, uh, to seeing to 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 be considering it all from the point of view of the man who is assassinated. But what Kara does in this book is takes you back 75 feet into the limo that LBJ is in. He's 75 feet behind JFK's limo. And Caro takes you into LBJ's mind and, and perhaps what he is thinking right before he hears that first shot. And, and here's what may have been going through his mind. His greatest ambition in life was to become the president. And he would do anything. He would do anything to get to that. We've seen this throughout his life. But there, that's the ambition. The reality is this, though. There are rumors that LBJ will be dropped from the JFK ticket for the 1964 election. So in that scenario, he would go from VP to, to nothing. There are also rumors and rumblings that JFK's brother, Robert RFK, will run in the 1968 election. The Kennedys at this point are, are quite popular. And so you're looking at a potential 12 years into the future of the Kennedys being in power. For a man whose life ambition was to be the president, he's looking, he's looking at that and realizing that time is running out. He would be too old at that point to run for president. So that's probably one thing going through his mind, just this, this ambition that has driven this man to just insane levels throughout his life. Perhaps that's the first thing. The second thing, this greatest fear of his life, of, of this humiliation. First off, he's 75 feet back from the, from the president. He's not near the president. He's shunned by the president and RFK on a, on, in a lot of situations. RFK hates the man. He's sitting next to, uh, LBJ is sitting next to his wife in this other limo, 75 feet back. And next to his wife is Texas Senator Yarborough who had made headlines earlier that day by refusing to ride with LBJ in another vehicle. This is in LBJ's home state of Texas, and it is just humiliation after humiliation after humiliation. This trip was a fundraising trip for the 1964 election, and whereas in the past LBJ had, had a lot of, of, of ability to raise money, he has lost a lot of that fundraising ability. And so even that, even the purpose of this trip to be in Texas, he's kind of sidelined in that. LBJ, at this point of his life, he, he described later he, that he had begun to have nightmares about being trapped. And so he is just this fear of humiliation. It is being realized in, in situation, in scenario after scenario. And not just personally, not just between JFK and him or RFK and him, but in the newspapers. It is a mass humiliation. The third thing that potentially may have been going through LBJ's mind as he's driving down that road is the, the two events that happened on that very day, November 22nd, 1963. The first was this. There was a U.S. Senate hearing about his longtime associate, Bobby Baker, who was getting busted for improper financing, uh, running a prostitution uh, house for, for congressmen and, and senators, and just doing a, a bunch of really bad stuff. And this was one of LBJ's closest associates. And LBJ's name was starting to show up in some of these proceedings. So at 10 o'clock Eastern time in the morning on November, Friday, November 22nd, 1963, there is a hearing in the U.S. Senate, and LBJ's name is, is about to come up. That same day, Time Magazine in New York is having a meeting at 11.30 a.m. about a story they are about to run about LBJ's money. And if you have listened to some of the other episodes, you know that, uh, well, l let's just say this. If you're making 35000 a year, which LBJ was, it, it's quite hard to become a millionaire. But... LBJ was a millionaire many times over. And so it probably didn't take too much to to dig in to, to see that something was was something was awry there. And that's what Time magazine was doing. And they were about to to put this story together and release it in the very near future. And these two meetings are happening the very same 
day is the assassination. I've had this nagging question in the back of my head this entire time I've been reading this series, and it's this. Was LBJ involved in JFK's assassination? I mean, just consider that list that I just read of his ambition, his fear, and these these two meetings going on that morning that, that had the potential to ruin him. Not, not just ruin his chances at, at the presidency someday, but to ruin his current position, to, to put him in utter, complete humiliation for the rest of his life, to be stripped of any position or power that he had. And then the, the, just this dread of humiliation and, and all of this that, that might come out. I mean, if, if you're a detective, the first question that you ask in any case is who benefits from, from the crime? And if, 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 if you're looking at the assassination of JFK, who benefits the most in this scenario? LBJ. Add to that, when LBJ was considering the vice president position, he, this, and this is in 1960 when, when he has rumblings that uh, JFK may consider him, he asks his aides how many presidents had died in office. And he had once made a comment about RFK that I will cut his throat if it's the last thing I do. He just hated that man so much. The assassination happened in LBJ's home state of Texas. And as a Kennedy partisan was, was to say, a Texas murder had put a Texan in power. I, I was wondering if, if Carroll would address this in the book, and he did. And he said this on page 353. It is possible, probable in fact, that he had thought through long before November 22nd what he would do if he suddenly became president. But unless one believes that he had planned or in some way was aware in advance of the assassination, and here Carroll puts in parentheses, and nowhere in the letters, memoranda, and other written documents in the Lyndon B. Johnson Library, the John F. Kennedy Library, and the other public and private collections the author has reviewed, and nowhere in the interviews that the author has conducted, has he found facts to support such a theory? He couldn't have foreseen the unprecedented circumstances under but which it actually happened. End quote. So Robert Caro has spent four decades of his life researching LBJ, and he says that he has not come across one item that would lead him to, to think that, that he had anything to do with the assassination. Lady Bird also said that uh, she wished it could have been her that was was shot and killed, just out of the fear of the tarnish that an assassination in Texas would put on her husband, LBJ. So I'll, I'll put it this way. The assassination files, they're, they're actually supposed to be released this year in October 2021. And if those files reveal the involvement of LBJ, I will not in the least be surprised. However, after reading this book, and especially after reading Caro's statement, knowing that he has spent four decades of his life on LBJ, I think it is less of a chance than I did after the first three books of this series. And another reason is, in my change in thinking in, in that, is just what happened after the assassination. This book covers a lot of that, and just the way LBJ handled it, and in the way he went about it, uh, it, it was it was truly incredible. And so I wouldn't be surprised, but after reading this book, I, I'm just not, I, I don't think it's much of a chance as I did after reading the first three books. As for reading stats for this book, this book took me 26 hours, 10 minutes to read. I read it between March 23rd and April 6th of this year, 2021. So that averaged about 40 pages per day. It's a 605 page book. The entire series of four books took me 120 hours, 35 minutes, and four seconds. I know that's nerdy to track that, but I, I just love seeing how, how long books take, and I, I want you to know so that you kind of have an idea of how long a book may take. This series took me longer to read than, than uh, reading through the entire Bible, which, which took 105 hours. In the next segment, segment two, I'll cover three main ideas, and those are, are, are these. The contrast between JFK and LBJ. Number two, the contrast between RFK and LBJ. And then number three, the title, 
Karo's titles are so good, and this one is no exception. I'll dig in a little deeper into the, the passage of power and how descriptive that is. In the final segment, segment three, I'll cover the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. In this series, Robert Caro does an incredible job of introducing you to a, a number of the people who are in LBJ's life. Some of those people will get a chapter, some will get two chapters, and some will get a lot more than that. But you really become, you, you, you get to know these people as well as, as LBJ. So in this book, you get to know John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy as well. And as you're reading about these people, you just naturally begin to compare them to LBJ. So first, let's, let's compare JFK to LBJ. And to preface that, let me go back really quickly to one idea that we've seen come up a lot in, in this whole series. And that is a comparison between the idealist and the pragmatist. If you remember from LBJ's childhood, he blamed his parents' honesty and idealism for their downfall. And he was fighting against that his whole life. He wanted to be a man of pragmatism, of action. He did not care what you thought. He wanted to know what you did. He, he did not want to hear your speech. He wanted to see what you could do. And so he made a comment at one point where he said, it's the politician's task to pass legislation not to sit around saying principled things, end quote. LBJ viewed John F. Kennedy as that idealist. He could give a good speech, but he did not know how to get things passed. I alluded before to the fact that LBJ was largely ignored by JFK. In fact, there was one scene where LBJ was talking to, to JFK about the best way to get the civil rights legislation passed. We find out later that, that JFK has, has completely ignored LBJ's suggestion on that, even though LBJ was the former Senate Majority Leader, and if anyone would know how to get a bill through the Senate, it would be LBJ. But not only did, uh, yeah, LBJ, but not even did, did JFK not listen to what LBJ said or do what he said, he did the exact opposite. And because of that, the civil rights bill was stalled. So Kennedy made some amazing speeches, he rallied the nation, and yet here's the situation upon his assassination. Of his major domestic legislative proposals, Medicare, federal aid to education, the tax cuts, civil rights, nearly three years into the administration of John F. Kennedy, not one had become law, end quote. So it's interesting to consider what would have happened had JFK not been assassinated. Caro says that many historians say JFK would have gotten the bills passed in, a, in his second term as president, but there, there's no guarantee of that. And it, it, it's interesting to, to view this in line of that idealist versus the pragmatist. So let's look at what some other people said about LBJ and in, in compared to to JFK. Here's Richard Russell, the, the senator we met in the last book, who who was was probably the main person that kept civil rights legislation from, from making its way through the Senate. He said this, we could have beaten JFK on civil rights, but not LBJ. Martin Luther King Jr. said this about LBJ. LBJ is a man of great ego and great power. He is a pragmatist and a man of pragmatic compassion. It just may be that he's going to go where John Kennedy couldn't. End quote. Then another another quote, or this and this is um, this is uh, Robert Carroll writing here. Barely two weeks before, when he had become the president, the two most important bills before Congress had been stalled, as they had been stalled for months, with no realistic sign of movement in any foreseeable future. Now, just two weeks into his presidency, both bills were moving. End quote. The two bills were the Civil Rights Bill and a Tax Bill. James Rustin said this, uh, President Kennedy's eloquence was designed to make men think. President Johnson's hammer blows are designed to make them act. 
Well, on July 2nd, 1964, LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act into law after it passed the Senate. So it brings us back to that question in the last episode. Who is more important? Who is more important, the idealist or the pragmatist? And it's just, a, again, a fascinating look at the idealist and, and kind of seeing that in the person of JFK versus the pragmatist. And JFK was not able to get any of those bills through the Senate. Uh, LBJ got every single one of them through after the assassination. So another set of contrasting characters in this this book were RFK and, and LB, LBJ, Robert Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. They were both masters of politics, and they, they recognized it in each other, and they despised each other. I mentioned before that LBJ had made the comment that he wanted to slit his uh, R- RFK's throat if it was the last thing he did. The first meeting they have uh, in this book, it, it, the first time they ever met, it's just a, it's it's not good. Uh, it, RFK won't even look at at uh, Johnson. For RFK, the world was very black and white, and he hated liars. And this is this is a very famous statement that RFK made about LBJ. But this is what he said about about LBJ. He lies all the time. I'm telling you, he just lies continually about everything. He lies even when he doesn't have to lie. End quote. Uh, someone else said of of Bobby Kennedy, when Bobby hates you, you stay hated. And on the flip side, uh, John Connolly, who was 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 also shot in the assassination of uh, JFK, he he lived, but um, he was was close to uh, of to LBJ throughout his life. And Robert Caro says that when he interviewed John Connolly, John Connolly would just t- would tell him everything. Uh, but but when he asked what LBJ said and thought about RFK, John Connolly would not say it because it was that bad. So mutual uh, hatred between these two, yet they're they're very similar in in their their approach, in the sense of 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 knowing what needs to be done to make it happen in politics. They're both pragmatists. So a large part of this book is the interplay between these two men, and it is very interesting. And then on page 581, Caro writes this, In an instant, in a gunshot, the world of these two men was turned upside down. End quote. That leads me to my third idea that stuck out to me, and it's that passage of power that happened at that, at that gunshot in that instant. And it's the title of this book, the passage of power. Yet when I think of that term, when I think of the word passage, to me it has this connotation of being a passive action, like it just passed from one person to the other. And if you consider the video footage, the photos, the media coverage during that passage of power, when the power was actually passed, almost all of it was centered on the person of JFK. In fact, there's really only one memorable photo from that 40 year period of Friday when the assassination happened until Monday of the funeral. There's really only one memorable photo that LBJ is in, and it's one that you know very well. It's LBJ on Air Force One with his hand raised, taking the oath of office with Lady Bird on his right and a shocked Jackie Kennedy on his left. All the other photos are of JFK. However, what you come to see in this book is that once LBJ understood the ramification of what happened with the assassination, what with JFK no longer there, with him gone, he understood immediately what that meant and what his role was and of that passage of power. And he began working like crazy. And that's what you didn't see with all of the footage of JFK is behind the scenes LBJ was working like crazy. So I want to read a few parts from this book. Here's Robert Caro on page 388. He says this, But for anyone who cared about the art of governing, about political power, about the art of assuming and employing, 
power in sudden, unexpected, without warning, crisis, about governing a nation, soothing its fears, restoring its confidence, keeping it on course and moving in such a crisis, about governing with hardly a moment for preparation, for anyone who cared about that, what was happening in EOB 274 during those three days was memorable, too. End quote. EOB 274 was LBJ's vice presidential office. And so he says what was happening there was memorable as everything else was going on with the ceremonies and the funeral procession. Here's, here's uh, Robert Carroll writing about Saturday. So this is the, the very next day after the assassination. By the time Saturday was over, Johnson had, since his confrontation with Robert Kennedy that morning, met with his cabinet as a group and with three of its key members, Rusk, McNamara, and Labor Secretary Wirtz, individually, with Eisenhower and Truman, with leaders of Congress, with the CIA director, with Supreme Court Justice Goldberg, and over and over with his nat nat national security advisory, had gone to church, paid his respects to the dead president and to the dead president's widow in the White House, and had talked on the telephone with, and one firmly to his side, perhaps another 40 people. End quote. And then the final one, a couple, couple quotes from page 424. As for America as a whole, during the past three days, the country, its eyes riveted on the uh, memorial services for John F. Kennedy, had paid little attention to Lyndon Johnson, and there was widespread uneasiness about what lay ahead. A nation's need to feel that, its leader dead, it had a new leader. But by the end of those three days, while America as a whole had not yet paid much attention to Lyndon Johnson, people who had, during those days, dealt with him in person, face to face or over the telephone. The Troika, the governors, the pr princes and prime ministers, the worried young State Department aides, his own ministers, Bundy, Rusk, McNamara, those who had watched him up close as he wrestled with problems that had to be resolved, that could not wait, knew by the end of those three days that America did in fact have one. End quote. And then this, this uh, last part. This is uh, Time Magazine's City, who, uh, remember, was preparing a, a very bad article about Johnson's money. This is what City had to say many years later. Even now, one must marvel at Johnson's total grasp of the machinery of government. There was no script for what he had done. And yet his assumption of power was flawless. When you consider that most transitions between presidents take place over a few month period from the end of the election in November to sometime in January, they have about two months to hire a staff, think about appointees and do all the other preparatory work. LBJ had none of that. He had a few instances. He had, he had about an hour where he was, they didn't know if JFK was alive or, or if he was going to make it or not. This is really unprecedented territory. And as such, it revealed a brilliance in LBJ's handling on the side of the, of the position. So the office of the presidency, that was impressive. On the other hand, though, it was cringeworthy, the handling on the personal side. I, I lost sleep over this book. There were there was one night the the night I read about the assassination that uh, I just I simply could not sleep, and the personal toll, uh, seeing Jackie Kennedy, seeing Robert Kennedy, and how there had to be a distinction even in those initial hours between the office of the presidency and the person of the president, and so that you see Jackie having to stand next to. LBJ, she, she, he asked her to do that, but she, she wanted to do that. She felt that was, that, that was necessary for the, the transfer of power, for the passage of power. And yet, uh, there were just number, a number of really difficult and tragic and, and hard scenes, uh, between RFK and LBJ, between, uh, Jackie Kennedy and, and LBJ. And that human cost was just heart-wrenching. So that was one night that I, I couldn't sleep after, after reading the book. It, this whole passage of, of power made me ask a question of, could someone else have done this? 
you just learn, you, you know, you've, I've, I've spent the last two months learning about LBJ and there's a lot that is disgusting, but there, there is this other side of him that it, it's, it's impressive. And the way he handled it, the way he kept almost everybody from Kennedy's team, and, and even though they hated LBJ, he, he, he encouraged them to, to stay on. Getting those bills passed, could someone else have done what LBJ did from the moment he knew that what, what the ramifications were? Could someone else have done that? It, it, it's something, uh, a, a fun history question to, to ponder. Now in segment three, and the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book, I'm going to give a little introduction before I, I, I hit the one thing. So in this series, you learn a lot about LBJ's fears, that fear of failure, that fear of humiliation. And it's brought about by this childhood in the hill country of Texas, where his father went from being a respected politician to the laughing stock of town, where LBJ would walk by people and they would laugh at him and say he was going to end up just like his father. And you begin to see these outward behaviors where LBJ is masking this fear. You see it especially in the first book of this series where, where LBJ is just cruel to others. He bullies others. He humiliates others. He humiliates his own wife. And so he's, he's pr- putting his fears upon others by hum- instead of him being the one who's hum- humiliated, he, he strikes first and humiliates others. You also get a little bit of insight into his inner world, and, and especially in the sense of, of how he often suffered from depression and, and, and dealt with depression. And it often would come at, at a period where LBJ was hoping to get to the next level of power, and he realizes it's not going to happen. He would just go into a deep, deep despair. But it wasn't until this book, this final book, Passage of Power, where it really hit me that LBJ had to overcome these fears to lead the nation. He appeared to be the cockiest man alive, and yet he was deeply fearful. He wouldn't even go after his presidential dream full force in 1960 because he was crippled by that fear. So whereas a lot of the books cover the, these outward manifest, manifestations, the inward manifestation hit me hard in this book. Caro says that he overcame that fear to, to lead the nation in, in a time where leadership was needed. Let me read a few sections. Just to start things off, the, there was a journalist who overheard LBJ in the Oval Office a, a few weeks after he became president, after the assassination. And he said, uh, LBJ said this, I'm not sure I can lead this country and keep it together with my background. He was kind of saying that to to himself. I'm not sure I can lead this country and keep it together with my background. Another really tragic uh, thing to to hear is just uh, someone said, nothing that the Kennedys felt about Lyndon Johnson could be any worse than what Lyndon Johnson felt about himself. So the Kennedys and and those around them would just ridicule LBJ, uh, just humiliate him. Uh, LBJ heard a lot of of these things that were said. Some of them would, would be said very near him to where he he would hear them. And this statement of nothing that was said about him could have been any worse than what Lyndon Johnson felt about himself. Here's Lyndon Johnson speaking many years later. Everything was in chaos. We were all spinning around and around, trying to come to grips with what had happened. But the more we tried to understand it, the more confused we got. We were like a bunch of cattle caught in the swamp, unable to move in either direction, simply circling round and round. I understood that. I knew what had to be done. There is but one way to get the cattle out of the swamp, and that is for the man on the horse to take the lead, to assume command, to provide direction. In the period of confusion after the assassination, I was that man. End quote. His fears had to be overcome for him to step up and lead, and he did it. One of the most powerful scenes in this book is when LBJ finds out that JFK has died. He's told he's gone, and aides immediately begin telling LBJ what he needs to do. 
he says no to, to a lot of these things and then makes a better choice, a choice where he's looking at the bigger picture. He basically goes around that room and tells each person what they need to do. He assumes immediate command in a largely unprecedented situation. And it was really incredible to read about that. And so that's my one thing. He, he overcame this inner turmoil, his inner fears, to become the president that was needed at that time, to become the leader. I just hadn't considered him from that point of view. It was, it was almost as if his actions were so despicable in the other books and how he humiliated others as his coping mechanism that I lost the ability to even consider his own inner demons and how those might be more powerful than his ambition. That his fears, no ma- <laughs> we've just seen how powerful this ambition was in this man, but that his fears could even cripple that ambition. And that seemed to be the only thing that could stop that ambition, his own fears. But he did overcome them. In, in other episodes, you've heard me talk about some of the evil that, that LBJ did. And this book contains a few things, but Carol says this one is pretty tame compared to what's coming in the next volume, volume five. And apparently we'll go once again into the depths of the evil in the man. As, as that book covers uh, when he's reelected in 1964 to the presidency. I really cannot wait for that book to come out. It is now my most highly anticipated book release, and we don't even know yet if it's going to be one or five or more years away. Either way, I will drop whatever else I'm reading at the time, uh, pre-order that book, and, and begin reading it. I, I really can't wait. So to recap... Manchester said this. He said, LBJ would never be a simple man. He was capable of tactlessness and tenderness, cunning and passion, end quote. Eric Severide said this, LBJ had to stamp his own leadership on his predecessor's administration, and this he did in a matter of days. He had to impress and beguile the Congress into a bill-passing frame of mind, and this he did in a matter of weeks. He had to imprint his own personality on the country at large, on a people just getting used to Mr. Kennedy's far different nature, and this Mr. Johnson began to do the moment propriety permitted, end quote. And the final, final quote about the passage of power. But this passage was a demonstration of the art of governing on a higher level than reassurance or stability. The higher use Lyndon Johnson made of these seven weeks, the use he made of the crisis, using it, using the transition as a platform from which to launch a crusade for social, social justice on a vast new scale, made these weeks not only a dramatic and sorrowful, but a pivotal moment in the history of the United States. End quote. I'm just not sure how many people could have stepped up like LBJ did. This series has been incredible so far. Uh, I didn't want it to end, even though it was, uh, it, t- it took me two months of, of reading. I can't wait for the next book to come out, the fifth book. Uh, and I, I, I hope you read this series at some point in your life. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought of this episode or, or other ones. You can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. The website is stock full of resources to help you find books and create your own reading list. I'll be back in two weeks to discuss this entire series by Robert Carroll. The week after, or the, the next episode after that, in May, I will be interviewing someone who has read a book about every single one of the presidents. That should be a really fun, fun episode. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.